Hey guys, welcome back to Real Housewives Recaps. Today we're talking revenge. I have really thoroughly enjoyed deep diving this book with you all. You've left me the best comments. I truly appreciate it. And I'm I'm excited to get into this part of the book. Today we'll be discussing dun, 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 the Vanity Fair article. So can't wait to talk about that. I am going to talk about Cordia's. I know it's out now. I just thought I'd give us all a couple of days to read it. I know it's been out in other countries. It's new for us here in America. It hit audiobook this week. That's why... I get a million comments saying it's already been out. I know, I know. I just don't, I do better with audiobooks. So I was waiting on that. I will deep dive it. Stick with me. Also, we do have a live chat coming up this Saturday. I'm very excited about that. 6 p.m. Eastern time. If you're around, jump in, say hi. It's just a lot of fun. We end up talking for hours and having fun, joking about, you know, these Hank and Skank and everything in between. So join me if you're around, say hi, and let's get into this episode of Revenge. I love saying it like that. Talk about Hank and Skank. There's her pretty face right there. She looks so sweet, doesn't she? All right, I left off. It was around 2017. They discuss the wedding of Tom, Skippy, and Skip. I'm not going to go too much into this, but is this not the... Tom Bauer didn't talk about this. I'm asking you guys, my treasure trove of knowledge. Isn't this the wedding where they were kind of, were they broken up or on the rocks, but supposedly she crashed and then we have all those lovely pictures. And by lovely, I mean pictures like this where she's scowling at the wedding (laughs) and anybody that dares to talk to Harry, which P.S. Anybody talking to Harry deserves a medal because that guy can barely string two sentences together. So if you remember in the last episode, P.S. I had so much fun recording that I'm, I'm excited to dive back into this, but she was such a B word to his friends. Remember this? They went hunting. It was the first time she was meeting some of them. She, sounds like she was truly awful to them. They sounds like they spoke pretty openly about how she would correct them, call them out, didn't want to have any fun, not into humor at all. I mean, again, what the hell is happening? I felt bad for the friends because it sounds like here again... She was awful to them. I feel bad for the friends, but mostly I'm like, you guys won this contest. You lost Harry, (laughs) who, again, crayon eater over there, and you lost Megan. Thank God for that, right? (laughs) You should be glad that that tumor's removed, but... (laughs) Sorry, I cracked myself up with that one. Okay, so so this is his close-knit group of friends. She acts like a beaver, and... Sounds like she whined the whole time. He bring, Tom brings up that she whined about the food, wouldn't engage with Harry's friends. And I'm like, what the hell was Harry doing? How did he not notice this? Hello, giant red flag waving, waving in front of you. Skippy guy <laughs> went on record to say she wasn't interested in us. Yeah, no, sounds right. But they sound like, again, they're the perfect match because they're just interested in themselves. Harry was upset because there's a photographer there. Who cares? He just cannot stop obsessing about the press. It's funny rereading this book after reading Spare and realizing, man, he's, what's the word I'm looking for? Insane? No, <laughs> he's paranoid. He just can't stop worrying about photographers. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Megan disliked uh, Skippy and his crowd, and their jokes and attitude to the world to her were unacceptable. I'm thinking she probably just didn't understand the <laughs> jokes, so they she assumed they were making fun of her. Seriously, these two sound like the worst couple. Can you imagine? You can't make jokes around them. Your jokes are being policed. Ugh. Gag me with a spoon. That is not where I want to hang out. That's awful. Okay. So in the following weeks, the friends were concerned about Harry and they thought, hmm, maybe we'll talk to William about it. Well, I love William. William also had his concerns and it sounds like they encouraged Harry, hey, dumb dumb, slow down, sit in the corner, eat your goldfish, drink your your juice box and think about what the hell you're doing. And he's like, "Mm, no, I can't do that. Megan's got my testicles, so I can't make this decision. (laughs) I can't. She won't let me slow down. She told me I'm bad boy. And also, (sighs) mummy. So Harry told Megan, and they both agreed that they were victim. This is a direct quote from the book. Be mad at the book. They were both agreed they were victims of racism. Isn't that convenient how that comes up when they don't have any other argument? It couldn't possibly be that they're two dreadful people and (laughs) 
hateful and just horrible to be around. Nobody wants to hang out with them. And who wants to be talked down to like that, right? But no, it couldn't possibly be that. It has to be the isms again. It's so stupid. Harry, he fret over becoming sixth in succession at that point. And he said, and again, quoted by Tom Bauer, love me some Tom Bauer. They didn't sue him, so he must be telling the truth. He said, I'm not the important one, man. Can you imagine? He's a grown-ass man. He seriously, we just read Spare. He talks like a teenager. That is an angsty teenager. In fact, that's more of a middle schooler, right? I'm not important. My friends don't like me, man. Oh my God, these two. Um, okay, so they've been living in Kensington Palace for about four months. There was, they decided that the, it's so weird, these two, they hate the press, except for that they love the press and they need the press. So they decided they needed to properly introduce Meg and they contrived some photo op at Polo Match. So my question is, if they had been living together in Kensington Palace and there was this photo, I remember the photo op at the Polo Match and stuff. What was the pitiful dog photos? Do you remember this? She was like laid up with her dog. I'll try to place it here if I can find it. But um, she was laid out with her dog and pouting because I don't know. She had to leave him behind. She was pretending to give a shit about anybody but herself. Who knows? But I just wonder, well, if the truth is she had been living for four months in Kensington Palace, what was the point of those photos? Just to make us be like, oh, poor Meg. She gave up her dogs for love. It's like, huh, you married a dog. So... May 6th, she watched Harry play in Ascot. Megan, it sounds like, if I understood this correctly, it's a little confusing, but Megan was being written out of suits. She found out there were no roles in any TV shows being offered to her, no movie roles, nothing like that. Wah, wah. So the palace said, no more Tig. So she's like, oh, no, I can't do these brand deals and talk in platitudes. What am I going to do? So... She told her team, you know, goodbye. I've used you enough. We're good. Seems to be a theme. So Tom Bauer again talks about how Harry, it's like he he was getting more outrage because Megan was suffering more mental anguish. Do you see the pattern here? She pulls this crap, tugs at his, you know, whatever heartstrings, and he's dumb as a box of rocks and he falls for it every time and he likes to be outraged so those two can feed each other in whatever weirdo game they're playing at um so mental health became more of an issue for him and he started talking more candidly about it harry did and again which makes no sense with the oprah interview where they claim that no mental help was available for megan harry if you claim that you went through this crap yourself, how come you couldn't offer the same help for Megan? Make it make sense, right? All right, we go into Prince Philip's retirement and how they kind of changed up staff behind the scenes. During this time, Harry saw Megan as helping to liberate him. They talk about how he started anticipating his insignificance. And I'm like, oh, Harry, you've been insignificant all along. (laughs) That's actually not true. We just didn't realize how insignificant your schmeckle is. No, how (laughs) insignificant your personality is uh, until we read Spare. All right. So they talk about, oh, I thought this was good. Bauer. I love Bauer. He brings up that Harry wanted an ordinary life and that he started becoming willfully careless It's like, again, I go back to that analogy. It's the kid that wants to run away from home, but pack me dinner first, right? He thought, I'm going to run away, but I still want all the privileges and the security. You know, it's just like, no, be a grown up. A lot of you guys have had the best comments about what job lets you keep the company car after you quit, right? I mean, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. All right, let's go from this pouty baby to the other pouty baby, aka Megan. Let's talk Vanity Fair. She found out she got the front cover and an interview. So, of course, she was thrilled. It was this whole thing where she was going to be interviewed and then photographed with this fashion photographer for a day. And the idea was that the palace had strict rules where she wasn't to talk about her relationship. She spun it as she would be, it'd be more like about her philanthropy type stuff, right? That's that's how 
It's supposed to be about her being an activist and a philanthropist. And also Suits 100th episode. So you can imagine what happened here. I'm going to get into it. But in a nutshell, it sounds like she was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> let's talk about my philanthropy. And she did want to. She wanted herself to look good. Tom Bauer does an amazing job of explaining Vanity Fair is known for having these fact checkers that really go into stuff. <laughs> they could not verify a lot of the crap she was saying. Again, sound familiar, right? She was throwing out all these philanthropy claims and even the Procter & Gamble story, that stupid story we've heard a million times about the soap and blah, 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 blah right? And how... It should be men washing dishes, too. It shouldn't just be female-specific. You know, you know the story. You've had it beat over your head. Good Lord. Okay, so they go into it, and <laughs> Bauer reveals, well, they fact-check, and they could find no such response from Procter & Gamble or from Hillary Clinton, and that it was a wink-wink, nudge-nudge, father's love for his daughter. Dun-dun-dun! That shit didn't happen! Sounds like her dad helped her think that they had replied. Yeah, it probably, yeah, they didn't reply. Back into this Vanity Fair. So the interesting part of this whole thing was behind the scenes that they, that Harry and Meghan had gotten engaged. They even go into, they got engaged and not caught. We know this because she decided to pull out her phone and take pictures. Sure. Harry had designed this ring that had two diamonds that belonged to Diana, and it was set in ye yellow Botswana gold. He was proud of his design. According to Bauer, she was determined to have it redesigned as soon as possible. Nice, huh? We find out that Harry did call for Thomas's approval. It was a phone call that lasted less than five minutes, and they hadn't, and nor would they ever meet, in, or so far, meet in person. So, again, interesting... I guess just to take that off the list, he called Thomas, but they seem to not care about Thomas. They wanted the Vanity Fair piece, though, not to be about that because that hadn't been announced. The Queen was out on official duty and they were waiting for her to get back to make the official announcement. Megan knew exact. I mean, again, the beauty of Tom Bauer's writing is it's not always in what he says, it's what he doesn't say in the way he leads you to come to your conclusions about what happened. Here's my conclusion. Maggie Poo knew what she was doing. She knew that if this relationship ended, what mattered is getting it out in the press that it's there. She was under strict instruction. Do not talk about the relationship. You know, we're not talking about Harry. And she's like, okay. Yeah. So she does this interview. And first of all, we talk about, oh, the guy talks about the interviewer, goes into this. I, I kind of love the way this interviewer speaks. I'm kind of bouncing around. I apologize. I'm trying to get my thoughts together. I love the way the interviewer spoke because he was very upfront about saying he did not trust her. He got a weird vibe from her, like it was all put on and fake, even to the point of decorating her apartment for the interview, covered in books about Britain and London and... He doubted she ever even cracked one of the books, which I find hilarious. They talk about how Megan was an unknown actress from the show Suits, which she had never heard of. And this interview was surprised that they were covering her since nobody seemed to know who the heck she was. But again, they made it, it seemed to be more about, well, it's because of her relationship to Harry that she got this thing. And yet she's trying to say, no, 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 I... I'm a philanthropist and activist and all these things. Meanwhile, behind the scenes at Suits, they were talking about, I guess, on set, things were getting more tense and weird. And um, there was conversations about how she would go from idolizing people to belittling them. That seems, again, to go with the other stories we've heard of, you know, getting close to somebody until... You've used what you need out of them and then you dump them. So I guess that was kind of happening on set as well. So the Vanity Fair guy, again, he had never heard of Suits. And meanwhile, Obin Scobie, which I still can't stand that guy. Um, and have you seen Harry apparently threw some words at him, which I kind of love that they're fighting now too. Harry is denying things that Omid said because... Omid contradicted Harry, saying that she never received 
what was it, uh, ho- hostage training or whatever. And, and, and then in Harry's book, he writes about how she received three days of it, how to survive if taken, you know, that the royal training, that sort of thing. So I just don't believe anything out of Harry, Megan, or Omid's mouths. I think they're all in their weird little drink in the Kool-Aid club. Okay, so this interview arrived, and knowing things were off limits, especially stuff relating to Harry, and he notes that Megan was acting very odd and questioning him and trying to do a reversal of roles. Hmm, doesn't that sound familiar? We've heard this controlling behavior before. So we go into, again, he t- states that the critical issue of Harry was to be avoided. Meg spoke like she had the winning ticket. So she knew what she was doing. She knew that she had to get this story out there, right? But then had to have plausible de- deniability. So that way it wasn't her that did it. Oh, the palace is going to be mad at me. You know, I can't say this, you know, that sort of thing. So she was telling the interviewer these things and he just kept, he talks about not knowing if she was being genuine and having a weird feeling. And the book directly says he had no reason to doubt her saying she was on set of Married with Children for 10 years. And then Thomas Markle explaining, no, she wasn't. Not like that. She would come up on Fridays. It was like a treat. It, she didn't grow up on set in her uniform like she previously said. She also had explained that she spent her senior year working in an embassy. And and then this editor finds out, no, she didn't. She spent five weeks in Argentina. It was... <laughs> Nothing she says makes sense. And again, we go back to, hello, it must be transmitted between the two of them because Harry seems to have the same affliction. Nothing he says makes sense. It all can be fact check and they can't tell the truth about anything. Megan told the journalist in the middle of the interview, I like you, especially your stutter. Isn't that nice? Isn't that what you say to somebody, right? (laughs) I mean, what a horrible bitch. What manners is that? I mean act like you've been somewhere. We have a, I mean, that's our Southern saying, act like you've been somewhere. That's what you say to your kids when they say something crazy, act like you've been somewhere. (laughs) So where is somebody telling her this? Nobody can tell her this. She's too stupid to figure it out for herself. Um, So the book goes on to say he felt like he was being played. He felt like he was in a game of cat and mouse. She was calculating again. That sounds familiar. We've heard that. Let's see. She wanted to hit her goal of saying certain things, but she wasn't being genuine in the way she was saying them. Um, He talks about after lunch, he got a weird vibe from her. He mentioned the word sexy, like she kicked off her shoes and put her feet up on the couch and was being all cozy. I was like, ew. (laughs) Again, sounds familiar. We've heard that story before. Hello, Yacht. Um, But so the interviewer thought, all right, I'll test the waters. Let's see. And he says, tell me about Harry. And she says, on the tape, we're a couple, we're in love. He presses her a little bit and says, well, what does love mean? And she says, I'm sure there will be a time we have to come forward and present ourselves and have stories to tell. There you go. That's it. So they know they have a story there. She knows what she's doing. She's saying this on purpose. So that way, even if he dumped her tomorrow or the day after the interview or whatever, she would have it in this big magazine that she and Prince were that serious. And that would be, see, this all ties together, even though I've made it a little clunky, it ties together with that that we heard where she wasn't getting roles being offered. She was been being written off suits. She was a desperate woman, right? So she, she needed to do something. So she needed this story to be leaked. Tom doesn't say this. I'm saying this. He just presents the facts. And I'm telling you, that's what's happening. Anybody with a head can see this. So, of course, Prince Harry wouldn't understand it. But the rest of us understand it. So she goes on to say we're happy and she loves a great love story. And then in the middle of this interview, out of nowhere, Marcus Anderson comes over. Now, I've had a lot of comments about Marcus Anderson and apparently, supposedly, allegedly, Those two had a little thing. I really don't know anything about Marcus Anderson. Uh, He, does he own the Soho house? He's tied to the Soho house. He also is apparently a PR fixer. This is according to the book. Interviewer's baffled. Like, why do we need him here? But 
he talks about, he feels like it was just all obviously orchestrated. He used that word by Megan. It was all orchestrated and he started to feel like he was being played. It's all set up how she wanted it to go. She wanted to talk about her work for women. He said it was, quote, slimy. And then he said this great sentence, which I'm going to read to you that I love so much. Ready? The proof will be if she goes to Rwanda and India after she's married. And I ask you, have you heard any stories, anything like that? No, me neither. Do you see what I'm saying? Like he goes back to this is all just PR fluff. She's, I go back to the private jet thing. They love to lecture us about climate change as they board their private jet. Make it make sense, right? They love to lecture us about all this work that they're doing. But it sounds like all it was was a photo shoot in Rwanda for her. So he went on. This was great. He went on to call some people that Megan had listed as friends. Do you know who he called? Serena Williams. And Serena denied being her friend. (laughs) She said that she was just an acquaintance. She ended up giving him a quote that says, you have to be, you have to be who you are, Meg. You can't hide. I mean, is that not a telling quote? I just find that all so weird. I guess they were like acquaintances and it sounds like they become friends since, but I think it's hilarious that she wanted to use her in the magazine as her good friend, Serena, right? So then they go to photograph this issue and she insists her that her freckles not be covered. She wanted to dress modestly. They tried to get her to take stuff off. She says she didn't want to, but then I saw the cover and it, I mean, she is wearing like a sleeveless dress, I guess, but it looks like she's not wearing a top. So I just, I thought that was kind of funny, but she wanted to talk more about the philanthropy and the activism. And again, this is where the checkers from Vanity Fair are like, they called it PR philanthropy. They called it superficial. She made no, (laughs) I love this, no deep commitments. The article comes out, right? It didn't come out for everybody quite yet. Instead, it was it was released to Buckingham Palace and her whatever her people in California. So the thing was her revelation was sensational. Intentionally, she had revealed her master plan, right? So it went into printing. They had gone to Botswana for her birthday, and Bauer goes into how she traveled like royalty and expected this is how her life would be. She even brought a magazine with her. It was some magazine I'd never heard of. And the it's not the Vanity Fair one. It's a different one. It had an interview about her in it. So, of course, she brought it with her on vacation. I mean, right? Like, does it hurt your back to kiss your own ass? Um, (laughs) So, anyway, so pre-publication happened. Copies released to her publicist at Buckingham Palace with the title, She's Just Wild About Harry. And there were reactions. So Megan had used her relationship with Harry to promote herself. What else is new? They, they seem to like to do that. Within hours, Megan called and hysterically described Buckingham Palace's fury because this is not what was supposed to happen. So, of course, what's she going to do? She's going to break into tears and say, no, 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 no. I didn't authorize this, even though she knew what she was doing. The only one that can't see it is Harry. He's busy eating crayons in the corner. He doesn't understand anything. Uh, She wants to know why the focus wasn't on philanthropy. Again, this is where Tom shines. He points out, well, Megan didn't get the cover on her own. She didn't get the article on her own. It's because of who she was likely to marry. That's why people were interested. (laughs) Um, So Megan calls up that interviewer, Kasher is his name, Kashner, I believe, and says, and it's quoted in the book, I'm very disappointed in you. I thought this could be an actual friendship. So again, she used him for what she wanted and is immediately dumping him. So I find that very funny. Of course, Kashner was like, what the hell? Um, she, he knew she'd love the puff piece of it all, but he says he was puzzled by her reaction. I'm not. She got what she wanted. She got it in print that she and Harry are a thing and, you know, about to be engaged. They were already engaged at this point, but, you know, publicly about to be engaged. And so she knew what she was doing. And then I'm sure when Buckingham Palace was like, whoa, 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 you weren't supposed to talk about Harry. She burst into tears and said, 
you know, he's the ist, you know what I'm talking about? Like he's, he made me do it. He hates women. He hates freckles. He hates whatever she chose at that moment. That guy hates him. So he wrote this without my permission. She was also mad that her Procter and Gamble stuff wasn't included. But again, I love this. The fact checkers were like, we can't print it. We can't even find that it's true, which I absolutely love. They have no proof that it happens. And that's where we get the line. It was fictitious, invented by an adoring father. Dun, dun, dun. Think about that when you heard that story 2,000 times about her writing to Procter & Gamble. I can't even say it again. <laughs> All right. So she complained and demanded that media do does what she expected. Again, doesn't that sound familiar? That's exactly what Harry's doing, too. They're complaining and demanding that media does what they expect. And if not, they'll throw out some sensational crap, right? <laughs> Lies. Um, <laughs> and the guy says, the interviewer says, I felt manipulated and betrayed. And again, I'd say, that seems to be a theme. That seems to be anybody that works with Harry and Meghan seems to have those thoughts. Guys, I'm leaving it here. Thank you so much for watching and sticking with me. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a fantastic day, and I cannot wait to keep going with this very soon. Yeah, check out my merch, Hank and Skank. Uh, check out my other channel. Hit that sub button, and you'll find more content there. I'm going to try to start posting more often when I have a chance, but... I'll try to put overflow videos there, so check that out. And thanks so much for being here. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.